so grateful for that. And I would encourage everyone to understand that it's a biblical principle to take rest regularly. So yesterday, although this doesn't sound like a big step for many of you, yesterday, I didn't think about work, which is a big deal. Like, I don't know if that's a big to you, but that's a big deal for me on the day before I come and I stand before you. And many of you know that public speaking isn't, you know, the thing that keeps your temperature down. It actually raises it up and the responsibility of all of that. And just having to trust him that yesterday I didn't have to think about that, that I could come here today and know that he, by his spirit, would just do his work and trust him in that. And that's what we do when we take times of Sabbath. It reminds us of how good he is and how we can rely less on our own strength and more on his strength. So anything you hear this morning, my prayer, my heartfelt prayer is that it will just come alive by his spirit working in you. So I just pray, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, do your work in this room so that I can step away, that you won't see me or hear me, that you will just hear him speaking directly to your heart, that you will understand that the message that you hear today is for you by one who loves you deeply. That was a question I wrestled through in my sabbatical. God, do you really love me? And you would think that's an ironic question for a pastor to ask, but I wrestled with that. Much of what I heard this morning in the testimony time is that, God, how could you love me knowing where I've come from? How could you love me knowing what I've been through or the ways that I stepped away from you or wasn't doing exactly what you wanted me to? I mean, sometimes I wrestle with that even now. God, could you, how do you love me? And maybe you have that same question if you're being honest. God, how is it that you could love even me? So during the week, because someone out in cyber world was watching, they got a hold of me and said, I want to encourage you with something that, uh, that they had gone through to understand how much God loves them. And they pointed me. Last week I spoke on Jonah, which is a book I don't often preach from. I, and he pointed me toward the book of the Song of Songs, another book that I'm not going to preach on this morning, by the way. But in this book, which if you know anything about the Song of Songs, uh, many in uh, Jewish culture weren't even allowed to read this until they were older. Uh, many would see this as a relationship, a love relationship uh, characterized between a man and a woman. There were others who would characterize this as a love relationship between uh, God and the Jewish people. And for us, as we look at the book in the New Testament, the book of Ephesians, we hear the, the example of how Jesus models um, the love between him and the church with marriage. So this is a book about a love relationship between a man and a woman, a he and a she. And in this, I just want you to hear this in light of how much it could possibly be if we read it in the idea of how much Jesus loves his church, how much God loves you and me. We won't get into all the specifics, but here it says, just hear these statements. Your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. We already heard about the perfume this morning. How right they are to adore you. It goes on. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Let him lead me to the banquet hall and let his banner over me be love. He calls out to me, and he says, show me your face. Let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet. He calls to me and says, I want to hear your voice. I want you to be in my presence. And she says, my beloved is mine, and I am his. This is the church crying back. This is us calling back to God. Jesus, do you love me? He says to me, how beautiful you are. And if you go through the scriptures, it says, I love this about you, this characteristic, this characteristic, this characteristic, and the list is lengthy. It goes on in detail about how he loves her. He says, you are as beautiful as Terza, my darling. My dove, my perfect one, is unique. You are made uniquely in God's image. And he loves your uniqueness. And so we say to him, I beloved, I belong to my beloved, and his desire is for me. Love 
It talks about in the very last chapter of this book, place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. God loves me. And he loves you. In a way that he puts this beautiful book together to explain how deeply and madly and uniquely in love he is with us because he made us uniquely. <clears throat> I want to talk about that more in a moment, about how much God loves us. That was one question I was thinking through my sabbatical about. Another one, that I was, if I'm just being honest with you, which I try to do, I hope you know that, I just try and be as transparent as I can when I'm up here. Another question I had is, why isn't the church growing? Why does it seem like, maybe I'm wrong, but why does it seem sometimes that the church isn't growing? Whether that's our church or churches in this Annapolis Valley or churches across Canada or the world. Why does it seem like, seem like churches aren't growing? And I wanted to understand an answer to that question as well. And this morning, combining those two questions, I hope that we will understand that the churches have the deep capacity to be loved, and churches have the deep capacity to grow because that's what they were made to do. We were made to experience and live out and extend love, and we were to understand that we are made to grow and grow in his authority, in his power, in his purpose, and we have the ability to grow. There's no church doing what it's called to do in the richness of the soil that he calls us to be planted in that cannot grow. There's no person so far away from God that he or she can say that I can't be loved because he has never stopped loving me. So if you ever have those questions on your heart, I want to just delve into those a little bit more this morning. If you feel like, oh God, do you love me? And why does it feel like the church just isn't where it's supposed to be? You can explore those questions with me. We used to think, and maybe you still think, that churches grow by this sort of strategy. Transformation takes place if we just have enough truth and we just play out enough good choices in our life according to our own willpower, right? So we had this, you know, diagram going where we had, we had, the will of God or the word of God and the mission of God and the spirit of God all combining, when those are in combination, we are in the spirit's kingdom living space. It's the kingdom on earth. That's what happens. When we are living fully in the word of God, living out his mission, the mission for God, and being empowered by the spirit of God, then we are exactly in the sweet spot of where he wants us to be. And we will grow. That's, that's just the way it works. All of the elements are in the right place. The problem is that sometimes we get the formula wrong and say, if I just know enough biblical facts, and if I just do enough good deeds, and if I'm just strong-willed enough, that the overflow of all of those efforts will create the results that I'm looking for. And I'm going to tell you that there's something very key missing from all of that. Well, two key things. One is love, right? Because I can learn lots of facts without knowing the source of those facts, God himself, and understanding how much he loves me. I can go and do something good in my environment around me, in my world, in my streets, in my neighborhood, at my workplace, at my school. I can do good things in those areas, and I can say I'm doing all of these good deeds and yet do them without the love or being sourced in the love that they're meant to be expressed by. And I can do a lot of things in my own strength. Let's just be honest. I can do a lot of things in my own strength. But they hold no comparison to the supernatural power that is available to me by the Holy Spirit. They just don't create the same results. These are pseudo-efforts. Pseudo effort about knowing, pseudo effort about doing, pseudo effort about empowerment. And we think that the result is going to be there for the church to grow and for our hearts to grow in love from him and for him and to the world. It just doesn't work that place. It worked that way. So instead, as I've been learning over this uh, period, and I, I told you about a book last week. Someone was had their hand out there. And uh, so this was the book I've been reading. And thank you, Tim, for letting me 
borrow this book, and I haven't highlighted it yet. I, pro I, I promised I, I wouldn't do that. I, I highlight my books. When I read, I just do. I, I make a mess. But I didn't do this. You can have this back, I promise, and I'm going to get my own. So there you go. I will do that. This is called The Other Half of Church. And in The Other Half of Church, um, I'll, I'll explain the, one of the main premises of this in a moment, but one thing that it does talk about are four key ways that the church grows. And the church grows when we abide in Christ. Now, I have to take you back. Now, this is going to, just get ready, because this is the summer. So we're just laying the groundwork here, and we're going to see how far we get. I do have a clock. And I will be attentive to it. But I want to take you back to John chapter 15. And in John chapter 15, we already talked about it in, in uh, early May when the group discussion had the couches and all the people were talking about John 15 and their community group sort of set up. If you weren't here, then uh, you missed out. But I was able to watch it online because it's in a secret place, and I was able to watch it. And I was able to listen to them talk about John 15. Now, I want to take you back there. I want to point out key verses from this chapter, eight particular verses, that I think will help us understand that God wants us to grow as a church. But it will not happen without understanding his love for us, and it will not happen or extend without us Remaining in his love. Let's just hear the word. Starting in chapter 15, verse 4. Remain in me. In this setup, God is the gardener in this, you know, uh, in this story. And Jesus is the vine. And we are the probably branches. Okay, good. So remain in me, and I, am also, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, which makes sense, right? Like a, a branch disconnected from the source. Of, of nutrients, it, can't, it just can't grow, right? It's going to wither up and die. So remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And I wish we could just meditate on that for like the whole morning and just stay there. And I would encourage you to, to, to go into your quiet place and meditate on that in those Christian spiritual sense. Just, what, just to rest on that verse and say, what does it mean to remain in him? I am the vine. You are the branches. Let's not get the cart before the horse. If you remain in me and I in you, you, what's the next word? Does anyone know? Will. Not might. Not sometimes. You will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I mean, this is the most basic teaching about Jesus. Like, you stick with me, we're good. You're apart from me. Nothing that you ever wanted or expected was going to take place, and I don't know why you would think it would, which is exactly what takes place when we stand over here and learn lots of things about Jesus, do lots of things that look like Jesus, and are empowered by strength that isn't Jesus. And we expect the same results. That is not the way it works. Verse 8, this is to my Father's glory. Remember, that's the reason we're here, to bring glory to the Father. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Did you know that the way that you bring glory to God is by bearing fruit? And you can't bear fruit apart from him. Which means, dun, 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 if you're not bearing fruit, you are not glorifying the Father. So if the church is not bearing fruit, we're not glorifying the Father. No matter how many times we meet, no matter how, how loudly we sing, no matter how spiritual we sound, if we are not abiding in him, we are doing nothing that looks like what he would have as fruit. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. That's how much he loves us. If you're doubting whether he loves us, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Jesus gave his life for us. At the instruction of a Father who is willing to give up his Son for us. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And this is why he tells us this. I have told you this so that... My joy may be in you, and your joy may be what? Complete. Anyone looking for more joy? 
I want to tell you that you're looking for more joy because that's the way you're wired. You are gifted by God to search out and look for and clamor on to joy. And I want to tell you that you this morning have many times, if you're anything like me, grabbed on to things that look a lot like joy, sound a lot like joy, feel a lot like joy, but are not joy. And he says, I have come and told you this good news about fruit, relationship, vines remaining in me, so that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Two more verses, 16 and 17. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I loved you so much. Even in your darkest places, I chose you. I chose you. You didn't choose me. I chose you. So don't get high and mighty in your own willpower, thinking, oh, by my willpower, I chose I chose you. And now I'm asking you to do what I've called you to do because I chose you. I'm the one in control. I am the vine. You are the branches. I chose you because I love you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, my Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Can you imagine? God just asks us to bear fruit. How do I bear fruit? Obey his command. What's his, obey, what's his command? Love one another. And that love one another can never happen without us understanding how much he first loved us, which, by the way, he does. So this is, it seems so basic, but we need to understand the basis for growth starts with joy, and joy is only sourced in our obedience and love for the one who chose us. So this book that I, that I was reading, and again, I don't put any book on a pedestal like, like the scripture, so just don't get excited about the book. But the book pointed me toward an idea. And if this idea is right, and it's been proving itself right in the way that it's played out in the way I've been studying it, is that there are four things that affect our growth as a church. Four key things. I'm sure there are others, but four th things in this book that were pointed out. Number one is, are we a people of joy? Number two, are we a people of what they term hesed, which is, which is a Hebrew form of the word agape love? Okay? Agape, and I like how it's explained. Agape, have you ever read 1 Corinthians 13, like the one, the chapter they read at weddings? And it's the one that sort of, it talks about love and all of its broadness. They do that because the word agape isn't satisfactory or suffice enough to understand just how it's so entrenched in the Hebrew word hesed. It's this, it's this idea of sacrificial love for one another. It's this deep, caring, covenantal, very rich, you know, sacrificial love for one another that we should have for one another. So there's this joy, there's this love called hesed, or agape, if that's a good way for you to understand New Testament-wise. And then there's this idea of group identity. What do we believe as a body? What, how do we function as a body? What are the things that we value? And what are the, what are the purposes of our group? So we think about that as a group. We'll talk about that later this summer. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then fourthly, it's this idea of healthy correction. That when we get off course, are we a people that can accept healthy correction from one another? So this morning, without overwhelming you, I just want to talk about primarily joy. I want to talk about what it means to be a people of joy. And can we be a people of joy apart from the vine? No. No, you can't. You cannot be a people of joy without Jesus. You can't. You can't be a people of joy without understanding. You can't testify about the goodness of God without understanding just how much he loves you. You can't. You can't be a people of joy without that. So I want, to I want to talk about that in this new season of growth. And I really believe that this is the middle of summer. I, I know we often talk about September as our new season. I want, Septem I want July to be our new season. I want this summer to be our new season where we just say, we're going to live a new season out. I want us to consider what it means to start this new season of growth. Today, I would like to focus primarily on joy. And the temptation will be that you already know about it. That you know what's required under these two broad categories of joy and love, which are are deeply entrenched and interconnected. But I want you to resist that temptation. I want you to open your heart as if you've never heard about joy before. And I want you to experience this as something new, especially if you desire to grow and mature in Christ. 
Because remember, the quality of our fruit, the quality of what comes out of this space, out of our hearts, is only, it's only going to be related to how deeply we are entrenched in the vine, how connected we are. I am the vine, you are the branches. We are dependent on that connectivity, and we are dependent on that connectivity because it connects us to the richness of the soil. The richness of our soil is dependent on joy. Now, joy, from an earthly perspective, is the emotion of great delight. Have you ever felt great delight? I bet you have. Joy is the emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something or someone, in our case, who is exceptionally good or satisfying. Great delight. And it's caused by something else. So when you have something, it's not something you've manufactured. It's something you've latched onto. In Psalm 16, verse 11, it says, In your presence... In your presence, this is a prayerful approach. In your presence, oh God, is fullness of joy. That's where you find joy. You either believe it or you don't. I mean, anything else you latch on to is pseudo joy. In John 15, verse 9, Jesus tells his disciples, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. And he says, as we've already read, just as I kept my Father's commands and remain in his love, I have told you this so that. A, my love will be in you. B, your joy will be complete. Now, how can God's love be in us? That's the first part. How can God's love actually be in us? By believing it and receiving it. He's already granted it to us. We just have to receive it. When we learn and ex- learn how to experience God's genuine, enduring, gracious, unconditional, sacrificial love, this has said almost, that we should have for one another, as revealed to us by the Holy Spirit, we can help each other increase this level of joy. And if we're living in joy, we are well on our way to bearing good fruit. And that's what we're made to do. Joy is relational in its essence. We need you and I together to make joy complete. But it starts fully in the Father. And I want to tell you what this book enlightened me to, and I like the way it did, is that joy... Joy is something we all are searching for all the time. Now, this is, this is the part that I, I told my community group when I was reading it the first time. And I hope, I hope that I can do this a little bit of justice. But your brain, which I'm not, a, I'm not a neuroscientist, but your brain has two key parts. And there's a right side of your brain and a left side of your brain. And we want to make it really simple. And I'll try and make it really, really simple. But you have like this dual processor in your brain. I'm just going to turn around and say, so everything that starts back here, every decision or thing that you experience in your life starts back here. And so you take it in, and it goes from the right side of your brain. It crosses over just behind your eyes, and then goes back over your left side of your brain and down into the back side of your dual processor, okay? So the right side is a really strong part of that processor. It actually is, has more horsepower, let's say, than the left side. And so this right side now experiences things, It crosses over, and then it travels back, okay? So up right, cross the eyes, back, back, okay? That's, there's your science lesson. Now, in the right side, this is the place of, I want to say right, because I know you're opposite to me, but the right side is where your brain processes physical and emotional and relational assessments. Like, it it just, it it does a scan. It's like, you know, know, like, it's like, it's like this image, and it try, processes everything that's in front of you. And what it's searching for is safety. What it's searching for actually is joy. Where do I find joy? And your brain has already processed the environment before you ever get to the logic part. Before you ever get to logical conclusions about what is around you, your brain is already six times a second making these assessments happen, if this book is correct, about what happens in your brain. It's, all, it's just snapping all the time. It's doing an assessment. You are doing an assessment six times a minute. And most of you are looking at me. I hope you feel like this is a safe place. But wherever you are, you are assessing whether this is safe and where do I find joy. And then it crosses over, and then it takes the place of conscious thought and speech and strategies and problem solving and logic. That's what happens. So before you can ever get to the point of logic, before your a word can ever come out of your mouth, you've already processed it six, six, processed it six times a second as to, am, is there joy in this space? Am I safe? 
it's almost like ants running to sugar. I don't know if this is strawberry season, right? They just know. They just know where the sugar is. And so just like that, your brain is looking for sugar if you're an ant. You're looking for joy. Whether you know it or not, you're looking for joy because that's how you're hardwired. And our right brain tells us and guides us toward the safest places, the places of joy, far quicker than we would ever imagine. But unfortunately, they will also lead us, because of our past experiences, to places of pseudo-joy, places that seem like joy, and because in the absence of true joy, they will settle for whatever joy is there. So there are levels of joy. There are levels of what we would call joy. And in the absence of true joy, they will, sat, they will be satisfied by pseudo-joy. What are some examples of pseudo-joy? It doesn't take a lot to think about. So you might say, oh, what could be pseudo-joy? My phone. My phone. If I look around and I'm, if I'm just laying it out there and I'm not focused on God at all, one of the greatest attractions for us is our phone. And we will go to our phone because it gives me such joy. But does that lead me toward spiritual growth, bearing fruit, maturing in him, having identity and purpose? No. In fact, it drives us the farthest away we could ever be from our purpose and, and, and the constant that we should have in our lives. It is the driver away from our joy. And yet we go pseudo-joy, 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 just like the ants going for sugar. We'll, t- we'll take anything. And it could be sex. It could be drugs. It could be TV. It could be Facebook. It could be a game. It could be food. Like, we'll take anything. Anything that lifts our spirits. Go back to the definition. The emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. If you'd break that down. When I get happy and I am satisfied, I'll gravitate toward that. That's what your right brain tells you to do. And it's almost like you have to go through a period of hardwire, a re- rewiring here to remember, wait a second, that's not true joy. And we go through our lives, and year after year after year, why do I feel so terrible, bad, why? Because you're making the same choices regarding pseudo joy. And you think this is going to lead you to the end in the same way we said these three circles, if they're all combined, my, you know, my understanding and my doing and my willpower are going to lead to some, fr- these are pseudo efforts. And he's trying to make it so simple for us. That if you just remain in me and accept what is true, you will experience joy to the full. So the more we understand and experience God's love, the the higher the level of the joy that we can experience and understand. And then our continuous decrease in the gravitation towards pseudo-joy. We won't even want to go towards pseudo-joy when we understand the true joy. Have you ever, I don't even know, I'm stopping in the middle of this. I'm trying to think of an, can anyone think of an experience where you thought, I used to settle for this, but then I experienced something up here. I didn't even know this existed, right? And I can't go back. I'm just laying it out there for 10 seconds. This is a bit of a fearful place, but does anyone have an example? Think about it if you do. Yeah, you do? Okay. Right, and you can't go back, right? You can't, you, and you don't want to go back. You know, I actually thought it was going to be some, like, very earthly example, which I love the spiritual example. That's great. I, I thought it was like, I, I, used to, I used to, oh, God, I'll just make this up. I used to use pancake syrup, and then I experienced maple syrup, and I can't go back, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just can't go back. Even though it's, it seems like it's more costly, it's just I can't go back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, instant coffee? Yeah, I can't go back. <laughs> I can't go back to instant coffee when you taste the real, yeah. And some of you, let's be honest, do you think there are people in this room who still haven't experienced good coffee? <laughs> How many of you have experienced good coffee, right? How many of you would like to go back? <laughs> no. Yeah, anything? Oh, you say haagen Oh, you have like... You have, like, a, a very low-level ice cream, and then you go to haagen Yeah. Yeah.
You know, those heavenly moments. Yeah. So you put in, you just fill in the blank for you, right? But I'm just trying to make it real for you that there are things in your life that you, you have been settling for and there is better. And once you experience better, you will not want to go back. Now, the fact is, from time to time, we still have to settle for instant coffee because it's the only thing available in the room, right? The only thing available is the McFlurry. That's it. But we want to experience what's better all the time. And that's the way we're wanting to be. Pseudo joy does not lead to joy. It does not lead to love. It does not lead to direction and purpose. It does not lead to maturity. That's what I'm trying to tell you. True joy does. So here's a question I think I know the answer to. Do you want to change the world? Yes, you do. Whether you ever admit it or not, you would like to change the world. Hopefully not so that everyone would look to you, but you would see something improve in the world. Most of us would realize that the world is not going to get better because of us. Right? But the world is going to get better when they know more of the one who can make real life change. I think some of us think we can't make those changes. But I want to tell you this morning that, believe it or not, you can change the world when you are abiding in Christ. When you are experiencing joy because the world around us, just like you are, are searching for joy. And if you are the source of joy, if you are a true representative of joy, you are exactly what the world is looking for, and people will gravitate to you, and they'll say, what is it? And you'll be able to share the story of what is true and what is not. You understand? Like, I, I want you to understand that you can change the world by being a people of joy, but you can't be a people of joy settling for pseudo joy-filling resources. You can't be a person of joy in your own strength. You can't be a person of joy with your first step forward. It's about taking a knee. You know, that's how people of joy exist. The only way you can change the world around you is with joy and with love and the purpose and direction of maturity that Christ offers to us. They will never be enriched by pseudo joys of food and sex and drugs and achievements and trophies and internet fame and iPhones. Ne it's never going to happen. Your fruit will never bear good fruit. Your, 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 your branches will never bear good fruit without good soil, without the connection to the good soil. I wrote here, your fruit producing soil is only enriched by the Holy Spirit producing in you a deeper understanding of God's love for you and his desire for you to share it with others, period. That's it. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Jesus modeled discipleship and obedience for us. And he says that you can have pure joy when you follow my commands. Nothing else is going to satisfy. And so, from now on in this new chapter of our life together, as a church, we have to create direction and opportunities and environments and practices for enriching our spiritual soil. Why? Because we are called to be and to make disciples, and you can't do it without joy. You can't. You can't do it without being a people of joy. So the very first step, and this is where I'll try and end today, because there's just so much more we could do. But understand how much God loves us. When we start understanding how much God loves us, that our joy increases. And I have to go to the scriptures, a good place to go, to find out how much he loves us. If you're wondering, does God love you? Da -da -da, here it is. John 3.16. God loved me so much that he sent me his son, Jesus. Good? Okay. In 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous or boastful. That's the kind of love that God has for me. He's patient and kind with me even when I don't deserve it. In 1 John 4, it says, perfect love casts out all fear. Have you ever been in a relationship where you felt like you didn't have to stumble over yourself or be afraid? That's right, because that's the way God designed it. You were never to be afraid. Even in the Garden of Eden when he created man and woman, it was not about, he, he said, where are, you, where are you? Where are you hiding? I never meant for you to be hiding. This is not a place of fear. Romans 8 says, nothing can separate us from God's love. I think there are some of us in this room who believe that there are things that you've done that have just made it so that you can never be loved by God. And he has never moved. He has never changed his status. He is unchanging in his love for you. Ephesians chapter 3 says, may you have power to understand how high and deep and wide the love of God is. You, do you hear that? May you have the Holy Spirit empowering you so because you can't on your own understand without his spirit working in you, understand just how incredible his love is. You can't. 
And so you just got to settle in and wrestle in with the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, in the private place, will you come? And will you just help me to understand his love? May you experience God's love, it goes on to say, though it is too great to understand. It's a work of the Spirit that teaches you that. Psalm chapter 5 says, God surrounds those who take refuge in him with his shield of love. It's a protective love. He loves you that kind of way. How precious, it says in Psalm 36, is your unfailing love. It never changes. It is never going to let you down. It's not a pseudo love. It is a desperately authentic, deep, rich, amazing love. And it's personal. In 1 John 3, it says, see how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. In the purest sense, when a father and a mother love their child, this is exactly what God is showing to us in this verse. He deeply loves us purely as our father. Ephesians 1, God adopted us into his own family. It gave him great pleasure to do so. He so enjoys you. He enjoys you when you don't enjoy you. And that's often. And we just need to understand that he deeply looks at us with joy. He sacrificed his own son for us. And Romans 5, 8 says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was his joy to do that. Ephesians 2, even though we were dead in our sins, he gives us life. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And in Romans 5, 5, it says, we know how dearly God loves us because what? Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. See, you can't do it. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. We sang about Holy Spirit this morning. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Why do we invite the Holy Spirit to come? Because you can't experience the joy of the Father without the Holy Spirit. You can't. That's just the way it works. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when you, in, when you ca- get captured by the, the knowledge that God chose you. God cares about the anguish of your soul. He is faithful to the very end. Though he brings grief, he shows compassion because of his great and unfailing love. And so he says, I need you to go and love one another. That's what he calls you to. Because you've been, been empowered by me, because you know my... See, this circle says, I deeply love you. I have empowered you by the Holy Spirit. So go and share the good news. That's what you do in joy. And it becomes very natural for us. We don't want anything else when we've experienced it. We don't want the pseudo joys anymore. All right, well, let me, let me wrap this up. Knowing the facts about God's love is not enough. The Holy Spirit in us allows us to also experience God's love in times of gratitude. And, and this is what I would say this week is the, the go away or take away sort of job for you. I don't want to say job. I don't like to say homework because we don't like that either. The, the privilege. The privilege you have this week. The privilege you have this week is to be a people of gratitude. To be a people of gratitude. To stop long enough in your busy pseudo life to say, God, why is it that I would give you thanks today? We do that in times of prayer, in worship, as we journal, as we take times of solitude and silence, Sabbath, viewing the world through his eyes. Because gratitude is what fills our tank when joy is depleted. Our joy gets consumed very quickly in this broken world. There are things that want to steal our joy, and gratitude allows us to refuel like a Formula One race car. It can have all the components to go fast, but we need his joy in us to do the job that it's meant to do. When my tank is empty, I act like a different person. Have you ever been hangry before or know someone who's been hangry before? Yes, and they act differently when their tank is empty. Don't they? Don't point. But I'm saying we act differently because we become depleted. And so we need to become refueled. And the refueling comes with times of gratitude because it leads us toward God's love. And God's love fuels us toward joy. And joy is what changes the world. It's an obedience to Jesus who chose you and chose me because he loved us first. The call for this summer, this new season, is that we would be a people of joy because these joy fill-ups help us regulate in times when we experience sadness and anger and fear and shame. Now, I want to say those, those feelings are very real, and you will experience those, but joy creates an alternate path. It's like a bypass surgery where when you get a stint put in, 
and the joystick it goes in, and you can bypass all of those emotions, live with those existing within you, but they allow you to have the blood flow of joy retained. Jesus prayed that we would have fullness of joy, and that can't happen without the free-flowing joy that results from knowing and experiencing the love of the Father. Two questions. Do you know that God loves you? And two, do you know that the church can grow starting today? Because that's what we were made to do. We were made to do that. And it will never be happening apart from the Father. Remain in me as I remain in you. Without me, you cannot bear much fruit. In fact, apart from me, you can do nothing. Let's be a people of joy. Father, today, will you just continue to work in our hearts to help us understand that you